Why do you think I said we should pray for our leaders? Not sit around and become the expert on how bad of a job they're doing. But pray for them. Pray for them. Hmm? And when we pray for them, that's spiritual support. You know what happens when you pray for a leader? God gets involved big time. Through that petition, God gets involved. Why? Because he already set that principle in the Old Testament. But if you pray, collectively pray for somebody, he will react. It doesn't fall upon their fears. And if he gets involved with the president, then that's when righteousness begins to yield righteousness. You have that right to ask the Father to get involved in situations here on this earth. You do. But if you don't ask, he already told us what he would do. He won't act. It'll be left in your hands, and you'll have the consequences. See, he gave us responsibilities here, too. You're not just some average person on the earth who has no authority, no ability. That's not who you are. You have a hotline directly to the heavens. And the Bible did say, because you belong to him, you go boldly to the throne of grace to find help in a time of need. Let me stress that again. To find help in a time of need. Not just go boldly to the throne. No. You go boldly to the throne of grace for a purpose. And what is that purpose? To find, to find help in a time of need. In that one passage, it's also telling you when to pray. And what to pray for. And what your job description is. Which is beautiful, by the way. Let me tell you why. To find help, to, to, to boldly go to the throne of grace and find help in a time of need. So you pray when there's a need, right? You find help in a time of need. See, the world scrambles and they try to fix things. And everything they touch is not like Midas. Everything they touch turns to, well... It turns to stuff, not gold, but to stuff, doesn't it? Everything they touch, it gets worse. They sweep things under the carpet. They prop it up by propaganda, making it look like something it's not. And it's getting worse and worse. Here's what the Lord did. Let me tell you how that's real. How that your prayers, finding help in a time of need is real. Everybody calm your minds real quick. You ready? How many times has God showed you a true need in any given situation. There it is. How many times have you have you viewed something on television and God revealed, he had revealed to you what they really needed? You didn't say anything because you could never find anybody to pray with about those things. So you just keep it to yourself. How many times have you walked in or, or knew about somebody's situation and God opened up your mind and you knew exactly what they needed? Why does he give you what people actually need? And sure enough, as time goes on, it's proven they needed that thing. Everybody else around you, they're voicing things they don't need. God gave you what they do need. Why would he give, why would he open your eyes to what's really needed? Because he put the power within you to petition directly to him. That's why that goes for your families too. Haven't you noticed? You can look at a situation and say they need forgiveness. They need more love. Right? That person probably shouldn't go forward with that type of hatred. They need to they need to purge that and everything will be okay. He gives you insights into things like that. And when he gives you insights, he does so for a purpose. He will not open your eyes in vain. God does nothing in vain. If your eyes are opened to something. That's when you go into prayer. When you go boldly to the throne of grace to find help in a time of need. And when you care, you're going to find a way to get to the most high. If all of us had one child and that child was dying, I can assure you that we would find a way to get to the most high. And if we ourselves couldn't get to him, we'd call everybody up we know and say, hey, I want you to pray for my child. Because... My child is dying. 
Now I want you to petition to the Lord. See, when we love someone or something, we will find a way. Well, newsflash, God gave you insight into a great many things, not for you to criticize. A lot of people use that gift the wrong way. Their eyes are open to something. They see something wrong, and immediately they go and tell somebody else what they saw, what was wrong. No, God gave you that ability so you can make a difference, not so you can make a conversation. And then sometimes you wonder why things in the earth are so dull. Why do we seem so powerless sometimes? Because we're not utilizing what God has given us according to his principles. We keep trying to use or to mimic or emulate other people. You're one of a kind. You're the only one like you. There's no one on earth like you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm telling you right now, you were not made in vain. You were made for a high purpose. There are some promises coming. Of course, we're going to cover this biblically, but I'm going to read. I'm going to read this to you guys in Zechariah, just in case you missed it. I'm going to read this to you. I'm going to go through this. Can I go through this? You guys have time for me to go through this one time, just one time. The Bible is so. It, the, the Bible's incredible to me. It really is. It is just absolutely incredible. And and let me let me start here in in, in Zechariah. It says, "Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll." Zechariah talking. He saw flying roll, and, I, and, and he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof is 10 cubits. You heard me mention that that 30 to 5 ratio is the ratio of an ICBM, intercontinental ballistic missile. But more specifically, it is of a specific type, which is so surprising. A flying roll, by the way, Right, by the way, is a, uh, uh, I'm going to call it a gila. In, in, uh, I'm going to call that a um, megillah. That's in Hebrew, a megillah. Not, not a scroll, not a scroll. Not to be confused with a scroll, right? A roll. This is talking about a roll, right? A megillah. A roll. Now, a megillah. The way they, the, all the ancient pictures of a Megillah are rolled up and they look just like a missile. They look just like a missile. Because they carved, they don't look like the fancy ones either. See, because when they had these back in the day, it had one flat end. And it had one coned end. Isn't that something? One flat end, one coned end. Because you, they used to set them upright. The Megillahs, they would sit upright and store them. And the pointy end. They would always have the tip, so they would take it up. It looks just like a missile. And the dimensions God is giving here, right? Uh, the the, uh, the um, uh, 20 cubits and, and um, 10 cubits, the, the 20 cubits in length, right? And the breadth thereof, the breadth describes the outer regions or the circumference of something. So it, it was 10 cubits, right? Everybody knows how to get the... Um, how to get the diameter of a circle? You multiply you, you, uh, the um, you multiply that by pi, and so you're looking at a ratio or a size of 34.4 feet to 5.5 feet. Now, if you take a computer program, listen to me. If you take a computer program, go into uh, you can use Visio, whatever you have that that does things in inches or millimeters or feet or whatever it is, and you were to draw a box. And the, the width of that box was 5.5, whatever unit of measurement you use, it doesn't matter. It could be 5.5 centimeters, 5.5 uh, millimeters, 5.5 inches, 5.5 feet is what it actually is. You can do that. And then the, the height of that thing, right, make it 34.4. So 34.4 to 5. And when you draw it out on a computer, the computer is going to give you a, a, that, that representation of what it actually looks like. All you have to do is look at it, and you can see, you can begin to see it then. And sure enough, true to form, if you take that against any um, um, missile developed company, and you run that against their templates for any vehicle like that, right? You're going to have that ratio, that 30 to 30 to 5 ratio. It's a variant in between that 30 to 5 ratio. 
you're going to have that. That is amazing. Out of all the dimensions, why those dimensions? Oh, you haven't heard the good part of it yet. And he, and he says, uh, then he said unto me, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. This is the curse that goes over the whole face of the earth, right? The curse. So it's not a good thing, right? It's not a good thing. It's a bad thing. This is a curse that goes over the whole face of the earth. It says, For everyone that stealeth shall be cut off, as on this side according to it, and everyone that sweareth shall be cut off, as on that side according to it. And it will, and I will bring it forth. God says, and I will bring it forth. So it's a curse. Right? Now, it's so funny because those who steal, those who steal and those who swear, Dwell in a specific place. This is describing something God uses throughout the whole theme of the Bible. Because those who curse and those who swear dwell in a specific place. Now, back in the Old Testament, these places had a ge geographical boundary. In the New Testament, these are spiritual places. So wherever a person is, they can carry that place with them. Just letting you know that. But it's a curse. And it's going straight to them as for their sake. Because God says, and he says, I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. Here he goes again. He's naming a place. How do I know this? Because in the Old Testament, he named some places. And what did he say? In these places are those who swear falsely by my name. And they are thieves. And so here we have him, this is being stated in reverse. Where is this thing going? It's going to enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. So it's going to land in a, specific, a designated place. And he says this, and it's going to remain in the midst of his house. Now a house does not, does not represent, this word house here represents the dwelling place of, or it could represent a nation, or it could represent a town, or it could represent a city. Not so much a place with a roof on it, right? But a place where people continue to go, a place that people have settled in. Just like I call America my house, right? I say it's my house because I'm putting this house and I'm deeply grateful to the Lord I was born in America. I don't care what anybody says. I'm, I'm very grateful for the house the Lord put me in because he did not do it in vain. I don't complain about the house either. If something breaks in the house, I attempt to fix it. I don't complain about it. Right? I'm not one of those people, the roof leaks, and then you say, well, this whole house is just a piece of junk. I'm not that person. I say, ah, let me fix that leak so I can you know, spare the rest of the house. I'm not one of the folks where if there's a, a leak in the roof, you go and condemn the whole house. That's not me. That's not me. Okay, so he says, and I hope you're not like that either. Hope you're not. So, so he says it's going to dwell in the midst of the house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. When was the last time you heard of anything consuming the stones? And if it stays in the house and it consumes the wood and the stones, you're looking at something that is powerful. That's a bad curse, right? That's a bad curse. That's a bad curse. Listen, then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, lift up thine eyes and see what what is this that goeth forth? And he said, lift up your eyes, look up, and see what this is going forward. Right, so he already saw the Megillah, the scroll. He already saw that. He saw where it landed, right? He saw what it did, right? But the angel says, well, look up, and now, now I want you to look up, and I want you to see what's going forward now, see what's traveling now. And, and it continues in 6 and says, and I said, what is it? So Zechariah says, well, what is it? Now listen to me. Zechariah, he knows what a roll is. He knows what a scroll is. He's read the parchments. He knows what things are, right? No doubt he's had experience with, with scribes. He's had experience with those who, who um, uh, translated things and who kept things. And he knows what these things are. This thing he's never seen before. How do I know that? Because he says, what is it? 
In Zechariah 5, 6, he says, what is it? Now, if you saw a car before and an angel says, what is this that's traveling on the road? You'd say, it's a car. But somebody who never saw a car before, they would go, well, what is it? Because they don't know what it is. Right? And I'm telling you right now, Zechariah, he knows what a roll is and a scroll is. He knows what a basket is and a, and a weight of lead is. He knows what things are. This, he does not know what it is. This is something he has not seen before. And the angel said, this is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. Wait a minute. This is there. He just turned that plural. He, so Zechariah says, well, I don't know what this is. What is that? I don't know what I'm looking at. And the angel says, that's an ephah. That's an ephah. And he says, this goeth forth. Right? It's an ephah. Then the angel added, he said, moreover, or in addition to that, he said, this is their plural resemblance all through all the earth. So they're everywhere. These things, what Zacharias saw, right? He saw one of them. But these things are everywhere. Everywhere. Do you guys, you got that so far, right? Now, I'm going to go ahead and read that. I'm going to get back. I'm going to, I'm going to share with you some things in this. Wait a minute. I have to read it first so you can get that in your spirit. So I don't want to get excited. So um, we have this ephah, which is actually an ephah. An aifa, as it is uh, pronounced, is a, most people say basket, right? That's in the common uh, translations. But if you go back, you get the root of this thing. An ephah is a, it holds, it's specifically designed to hold dry weight. Not liquids, not water, but, but dry weight. Okay? Like uh, grains or something like that. And here's the most important part. An ephah is of a certain size. Did you know that? It's of a specific size. You just can't make an ephah any size you want to. You can't do that. It's of a specific size. They had a standard on an ephah that they used to make. So it's of a specific size. Right? You're not going to grab a, a cup of coffee and say, well, this is an ephah. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Nor are you going to grab a, a big wheelbarrow and, and put stuff in it and say, this is an ephah. No, it isn't. See, so it's very descriptive. Not only is it a container, that's what you can think of it as, but a container that holds a specific amount of something. That's very important to note here, right? A specific amount of something, right? Now, let's continue to read. He says, and, and behold, he says, and behold, this is heaven, and behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. And this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. Wait a minute. Okay, stop right here. This, this is the one right here that really got me. And it really got me. At first, when you read this, you're like, okay, you kind of throw out the lid. And now you're just thinking about a woman. I, I want you to see this for what it is. He says, behold, there he lifted up a talent of bread, a, a certain uh, weight of lead. He holds this lead up, Right? He lifted up this lead, and the angel says, this is a woman. It's not, he says, not lead, it's a woman. What? And she sits in the midst of the container. This woman sits in the midst of the container. That's what the translation was. So when you mosey back in the Hebrew, you find out what the word woman means. You find out what Aifa is. And you're blown away. Even this talent of lead, you find out what it really represents. And you're blown away. You're blown away. Okay, here we go. He lifted up a talent of lead, a specific measurement, weight of lead, right? A talent of lead. That's a pretty big piece, right? Pretty big. It's a specific piece, more importantly. He didn't say two talents. He didn't say 50 talents. He said a talent of lead. That's a specific measurement of lead. And he says, this piece of lead that I just lifted up is a woman. Now, that word woman, 
is a very specific Hebrew word. What it equates to is a fiery offering. A fiery offering. Now, if you take the Hebrew, the Hebrew language is a numerical language. Based on what was used before it and after it, you have the interpretation or the definition of that word. You just can't do a eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Hebrew is very specific. It's not left open to interpretation. But can you imagine a long time ago, in 1811 or whenever they were doing these translations, when they first read it, they said, And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is the fiery offering that sitteth in the midst of the container. They would have said, Well, that makes no sense. Because they would have no context for what that would be. We do. But they don't. We most certainly do. Because that is a verbal description of a nuclear firing mechanism. But they don't have a description for that. They would have said, well, that doesn't make sense. So they opted for the other context of the word, which is woman. But in the law of the language itself, you cannot, you cannot say it's a woman. Because of the numerical values before it, you can't even say it's a woman. Because you wouldn't use it that way. And a mark was associated with it, and they just kind of dropped that off. Right? So he said, in the, listen, and behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. Of the container. And and he said, This is wickedness. So this listen, this fiery offering sitting inside of a container, right? Which he said, he lifted up the lead. Now picture this, he lifted up the lead. Then he describes what the lead is. See this piece of lead? Yes. It is a woman sitting in a basket. Or if we go back to the original translation, it is a fiery offering sitting in a container. That's what this lead is. Now, what could be fiery, right? What could look like a piece of lead? But the lead truly be a fiery offering, a specific measurement of a fiery offering? U-235, my goodness. That's like holding up a stick of dynamite. And you say, see this stick of dynamite? This is destruction. He held up that piece of lead, and he said, see this lead? This is a fiery offering in a container. Do you see how he's describing what the lead is? Or, more specifically, what the lead does, or what, it, what its potential is. Do you see it now? Do you guys see it now? Do you see it? Do you see it now? I want you to see how this is structured, so you don't think anybody's just making this up. Because the angel holds up a talent of lead, and he says, you see this lead? Yes. It is a fiery offering in a container, or it's a woman in the ephah. That's what this thing is. And I'm telling you right now, it's like holding up a stick of dynamite. So you see this dynamite? Yes. Well, this dynamite is absolute obliteration, right? So you can use anything to describe that. But most people miss this part. They miss it. And he says, this piece I'm holding up, this talent of lead, is a fiery offering in a container, and it is wickedness. It's not going to be used for good, but evil. There was, this is seven, there was hold up a talent of lead, and this is the woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, into the container. He cast that piece of lead into the midst of the container. And he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Of that container, the mouth thereof, of that container. That's the same, do you know, to get in, in the nuclear weapons we have today. There's a firing mechanism in these weapons right it's not like the days of old where you would just buy explosives to it and have fissile material right no we don't do it that way anymore do it a different way that's why i couldn't help but to see this as a mechanism a, a nuclear trigger inside of a warhead and it, it blew me away he said this is his wickedness and he cast it in the midst of the ephah he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Then lifted up 
mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, two fiery offerings. And listen, this is so funny. Listen, and lifted up my eyes. He said, then I lifted up my eyes, and I looked up. And what did he say? There came out two women. Now, remember what this word woman is. There came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, plural. For they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the ephah, the container, between the earth and the heaven. Now, now think of this. Let me, let me think of this. He looks up and he sees that, one, that word woman is fiery offering. He sees two fiery offerings. And both these fiery offerings had wings like a stork. And what did they do? They lifted up this container. This firing mechanism. Where did they lift it up to? Between the earth and the heaven. Up in the sky. Because he said he looked up and saw it. They were launching. Isn't that something? They were launching. Then said I to the angel that talked with me. Whether do these bear the ephah? How are they holding up the... Where are they going to hold up the ephah? Right? Don't let that stuff hit the ground. In other words, now this verse says, whether do these bear the ephah? Have you ever looked at that word, bear the ephah? You ever looked at that? Where do these bear the ephah? Because in the translation, there were two words associated with this, and one was halak, right? One was halak, and the other one was eth, aith, eth, hala or aith, right? So one of them, one of them is in, uh, they just kind of, I, I believe they put a lesser definition on it. Right, but we're talking about when he says, when he uses this word, whether they bear the ephah, right? That word depicts motion. It also depicts standing something up. Where are they going to stand this up at? More specifically, it relates because they had another word associated with it, right? Where are they going to stand this up at? Where are they going to set this at? Where is this going to be put at? That's why I said, whether do these bear the ephah? Where are they going to set these up at? Do you see? Do you hear it? Where are they going to set these up at? And he said unto me to build it an house in the land of Shinar. Where are they? So in verse 10, he says, where are they going to set these up at? Because that word, whither do these bear? That word bear means to set up. And he said, whither do these set up the ephah, the container? Where are they going to set this container up at? Because this thing is pure wickedness. Where are they going to set this up at? And he answers in 11, he said, they're going to build it a house in the land of Shinar. A house is specifically a dwelling place. Where are they going to be at? In the land of Shinar. Where's their dwelling place going to be at? The land of Shinar. And it shall be established and set there upon listen this is the big one and set there upon her own base it's going to set there upon her own base that means this thing is going to have its own location its own platform I mean how clear do you have to be with this They didn't have rockets, nuclear weapons, back when this translation was made. They didn't have that. They could not, they, they didn't have that. So they opted for the words that were relative to biological things. But thank God the definitions were kept. And training for the usage of Hebrew words, it is, is still exists. And when you put the markings in place in the numerical value system in the context of how they're used, this is, what you, this is where you're at. Most people have read this, right? And they have used a few parts of it and then left it alone, really. But when you start to look into it, you, could, you, you start breaking these things down. You start looking into it. Of course, as the Father always, he'll guide and lead you into what these things are. You know what they are. Somebody says, South Iraq. That's right. But South Iraq is what? What is South Iraq? Anybody know what South Iraq is? What is another name for Southern Iraq? Or, or more importantly, I'm, I'm sorry, Northern Iraq. What's another name for Northern Iraq? 
Remember the the places in the Old Testament, right? Since in the forties and in the thirties, there have been some borders moved, right? The borders were not like what they are now back in the day. That that's some doctored stuff. Right. If you don't believe me, then go back to go go over to England or go reference England and go reference the material that they actually printed and look at the originals because they have them side by side and how they restructured the Middle East. Right. In the 40s. And then look at the original boundaries that were there. And you're just going to blow your mind. Your mind's going to be effectively blown. In verse four, God says something very important. Very important. He told Zechariah, he said, this curse is going forth over the, over the face of the earth, the whole earth. This is a curse that will go forth over the whole earth. That kind of negates where they are. Because they're going over the whole face of the earth. Now this term to go over the whole earth, you know what that means? Not to break it too far down, it means it's going to pass by all lands of the earth. That means it's flying overhead until it reaches a destination. Okay? And but most notably, when he continued to talk with the angel, and the angel said, lift up your eyes. See what this is that go forth. God said something. After he said, he said, he said, what is it and all this? He starts to describe it. But right before he got into all that, the Lord said what? He said, I will bring it forth. He said, I'm going to bring it forth. So then in Zechariah 5, 4, God says, I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts. And then he goes into detail why he bought it forth. This same statement in Zechariah 4 is also mentioned in the other books of the Bible concerning prophecy of the end times. In fact, if you continue to read Zechariah, you'll know it's that he is marked during the end times. And God said, I will bring it forth. Now, before you go say, well, a lot of people have heard their comments, well, God doesn't do that kind of stuff. He didn't do it. Well, yes, he used the Assyrian. He used the Assyrian and the Assyrian army to destroy, to uproot, to utterly make waste things in the Middle East, specifically the government of his own people that had become corrupted. And he got rid of that corruption. But he says when the Syrian lifted up, was lifted up, magnified within his own heart, God made a statement. Can an, can an axe, can, what did he say, how did he put it? Can an axe brag of itself or an axe handle brag of itself? In other words, he was telling the Assyrian, telling us, God used him as a tool for his blessing. God put us here for his purpose. We're not here for our own purpose. God used the Assyrian to accomplish what he accomplished. Even the priests at that time rejected the notion that God would use a heartless person like that to execute his will on the earth. God said, yes, he did it. Yes, he did it. God did that. And then God God got rid of the Assyrian. That's why you read about the northern army. God says what? I'm going to bring the North Army right to you, Israel. And it will desecrate, destroy, and stamp into pieces. But then after it's over, when they think they have done it, I will remember everything I promised you. And by my power, I will drive him off so far, you'll never see him again. So God uses these elements of the earth to do what? What do they always do? I need to get you to see this. They always do something. What do they do? They always rid a country of its foulness, its deep, dark iniquities. They uncover things. They expose things. They cause the truth to come forward. 
They only destroy darkness. They do not destroy good. What do you think? See, why do you think Satan still exists? Because Satan is going to be used to defile darkness. Not good. Satan will never touch what is righteous. He will touch what is corrupted. That's what he's here for. Because under him, all corruptness will be collected. All of it will come forward. See, it's, it's true of all darkness. When a king of darkness rises, so will that darkness. God does this to expose all darkness in view of all eyes. And then he passes judgment upon it, not before. These weapons and things have been made throughout the earth over time. They're not going to be satisfied until they use them. People will not touch the righteous. The righteous will never perish. But the Lord will certainly destroy darkness from among his people. He already said he would, didn't he? He said he would destroy iniquity from among his people. He would destroy all this perverseness from among his people. He'll destroy the wickedness from amongst his people. It's always exposed first and then destroyed. God, When God does something, he does it in honesty and in righteousness and in truthfulness. He has no fine print and no technicalities. He will cause something to rise right before he passes his eternal judgment upon it. But your eyes will always see it first. And it always rises. When a king of darkness rises. Because it's utilized like a vacuum, like the kingdom of the beast. What is the kingdom of the beast? It's a vacuum for those who are wicked. Why do I say that? Because it's only going to absorb those who agree with it. The righteous don't agree with the kingdom of the beast because God said if you're written in the book of life, you're not going to take the mark of the beast. You're not even going to worship the beast. The beast will only suck into itself those who desire it. You can think of light and darkness like banks. You have a bank of light. And light was lent out all over the earth and you have a bank of darkness and darkness was lent out all over the earth. Both are going to call the debts, but the people, some people, have utilized all of the darkness they could utilize, and they only have one coin of light. That's not enough. So when darkness is destroyed, 90% of that person is going to be destroyed, and only one little piece will be left, and that little piece has to go back to the bank. But some people have become 90% light. So that when darkness is destroyed, they will rejoice and say, I'm free. Do you see how that works? When you have become full of righteousness and you have a bit of darkness with you, when that darkness is destroyed, you're going to leap and jump for joy. But when you have consumed and have become darkness and only have a little bit of light, when darkness is destroyed, you will be destroyed with it. This is what you're becoming with every decision you make. You're becoming what you choose. Because what you choose is what you truly believe in. Isn't that something? And in the end, we will have chosen what we truly believed. Yes, it was called Persia. Just like the four kings that Daniel... Uh, wrote about the four kings in Persia that divided their kingdoms and were absorbed all throughout the Middle East. That power was distributed. But folks, speaking of darkness and light, that's why you shouldn't be scared. When the Lord comes back, he will destroy the darkness for the brightness of his coming, right? So if you have truly chosen Christ, then the greater majority of you is light. And so when God comes back and the darkness is destroyed, you too will leap for joy. Those of us who yearn for righteousness, those of us who, who just can't, you know, we just want the Lord's way to be implemented. 
right? Those of us who are looking deep down within ourselves, and we can't, I can't criticize anybody here. I can't talk about anybody here for what they're doing wrong because I can look into my flesh and that there's nothing I'm innocent of that I can't, you know, why would I accuse you? But I'm guilty under sin too. I can't do that. This flesh is condemned. So when the Lord comes back, the, the, the last vestiges of this wickedness will be put down and I will leap and jump for joy because I desire righteousness. I'm one of those who wants to keep the way of the kingdoms. I don't like it to slip and slide. I don't like that. I'm not one of those who takes joy in any sinful thing. If I get angry and God doesn't justify my anger through his righteousness, is that not sinful? Yes, it is. You think I like that? No, I do not. You think I like the weakness of the body because it can accomplish what I need it to accomplish? I don't like that either. The slowness of mind that hits, things just totally go off your mind sometimes. I don't like that. These things hold you back. What about the frailty of the heart? To know that your heart can be broken and it can stop you from a really good work for somebody else, but you can't notice them because your heart's been affected, you're emotionally compromised. I don't like that either. These things slow you down. Or your body has to stop everything just to eat. What kind of stuff is that? I don't like what it craves either. I don't. The body desires things that are bound within it. I don't like that. I don't like the cravings of the flesh. So when darkness is destroyed, I will leap for joy because I'll be free. But if I had pleasure in unrighteousness, which is to say pleasure in darkness, I'd be scared to death for the Lord's return. Because if I didn't like righteousness, if I didn't like Christ, if I didn't like church and, 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 and uh, surrendering all ways of me, and I believe in the ways of man, then that means I have become the majority of darkness. And when the Lord comes back, he will destroy that darkness. I'm going to be afraid. Because I, if I were to be that way, the majority of me would be darkness. So that when he destroys darkness... It would be 90% of who I am. I would have no existence. Those people, that's why he said, come out of her, my people. Be, my, be not partakers of her sins that you won't partake of her plagues. That's why he says, that's why he says, he will send them a strong delusion that they will be, believe a lie, that they all might be damned who loved not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Those who practice the unrighteous things of this world, who love to destroy people on a daily basis, those are dark people. And when he comes back, he's going to destroy darkness forever. And when that happens, if we are having enjoyment in these things, then our identity has become dark and will be destroyed when he comes. But listen to me. If you're out there and you're still smoking, maybe you can't get away from drinking. Maybe you can't stop cursing here and there. You hate the anger that comes into your body. You hate what you do to anybody else. You're clinging to the living God. You're crying out for Christ Jesus. Let me tell you something. All those ways you could not perfect. All those ways you can get away from. All those things that plague you in this world. When he comes back, he will destroy them. That's it you free and you'll never be in bondage another day because you don't have pleasure in unrighteousness you seek to be exactly what God sent you here to be and you're finding it tough to do when the Lord comes back he will destroy everything you couldn't overcome and you will be set totally free why do you think he says lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh that means you're in the middle of a process it is not completed yet you'll be fully delivered when he comes because all you couldn't overcome in this world he shall overcome for you it'll be destroyed see that's why when he comes it'll be a day of great joy for those who were looking for him but a day of gloominess and darkness and despair for those who had pleasure in unrighteousness. Because by his coming, he will destroy darkness. See how he comes once? 
and in his coming the righteous are delivered. But those who had pleasure in unrighteousness, who have become darkness, are doomed. But he only comes once. Do you see that?